I have this theory because right now in my brain, I'm like planning the future all, which is kind of what I typically do. But we really want to make education a part of what proof is. We've built it into the design of the new bakery that's under construction and talked about that with you guys. But I think what I'm most excited about is working on that particular problem is how do you provide an environment uh, in teaching about bread where it's possible to get some more practice than, than, otherwise, than otherwise normal in any type of class environment. You guys are in like the ultimate class environment, the, the school, uh, but, but just uh, going from a one day or a, or a three day or a week long experience, uh, it's really nice to get the, the repetition in, like you said, because there's something about being able to repeat 16 times with folding or if you mess up shaping on two loaves, there's another 200 to, to try on. Whereas uh, if you mess up shaping on the three loaves during your school or competition instead, it's, it's a different kind of training. I'm sure it's useful too, but it's more of the mental training of don't mess up the one opportunity you have, right? Um, so I, I think that there's something interesting. Uh, certainly we've gotten that feedback before. I'm really happy that you guys came uh, and that we were able to work this out. Uh, we've been trying to get people out. The idea of an, a baker's exchange, just my dream of uh, that we could have a world where uh, we collaborated with other bakeries or baking programs, uh, potentially sent one of ours to a bakery. Uh, they send one of theirs in return. Perhaps the owners could just keep paying their own staff members and we could then learn from one another in that way. Uh, the idea of having people out here for week long experiences. Uh, you guys aren't the first, but it's been a little while. Uh, but you are the first that have come from uh, a school. Every other person that's ever been here has been a cottage baker, which made sense. This is, uh, well, uh, this is a little bit of an odd cottage bakery. If we were forced to move into the type of location that we're moving into right now, which is amongst the most affordable commercial real estates in the entire uh, area that we're in, we would have not been able to weather that sustainably without a huge amount of debt. Um, it, so, so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's sort of an interesting thing where, where uh, for something like this to exist in the first place requires time. It's not that you can't pay for the commercial location as a baker. It's that in the beginning stages, if you want to do things this way, uh, this sort of really hard way, uh, you would have cut corners 800 times by now if you were forced to financially. So uh, imagine if we were forced to move out of this place well before it ever looked like this, because for the majority of the time we've been here, it's looked more like a garage, less like a bakery. Uh, it's taken a long time to get to this point. But if we had moved at a different point, we wouldn't have had any equipment. We wouldn't have had uh, as organized of processes. We wouldn't have known our customers. Maybe our customers didn't, wouldn't exist yet. And doing all of that simultaneously is just a very risky endeavor. What People say that most new businesses fail. Most food new businesses fail at higher rates than other businesses. Uh, yet the way in which our, I think we need one more, so we'll, we'll transfer this to another and we'll take this as sourdough, probably by hand. So I think, uh, this type of business is, is in particular, um, harder to get up off the ground. Um, have you guys noticed, uh, what was your impression of sourdough prior to this week? versus now. I, I'm really curious to know how things have changed and 
in that way for you? I would say I wasn't very familiar with it. Um, you know, had the concept. But I think coming here has definitely broadened my familiar um, with it, my um, knowledge, definitely. When, when you guys thought about sourdough in the past, did you think about it? Uh, did sourdough come across to you? Like, if somebody just said sourdough, was the mental imagery in your brain a loaf of artisan bread? Absolutely. So, so it wasn't like, because when, when I think of sourdough, I, I just think of Harriet immediately. And I think of like 30 different things that, that I'm exposed to, sourdough, and then like dozens and dozens of traditions around the world that I haven't quite yet touched with sourdough. Um, so has that, like, has that, has that been a change then? Is that what you're saying? Like, um, what was it like to see sourdough everything? Very eye-opening. I would say I definitely constricted it to this box of sourdough is just a loaf of bread. And boy, was I wrong. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, there's just so much you can do with sourdough. It's crazy. So you guys have, have prepared questions all week. Uh, and hopefully been writing things down as you've gone. So as I get this next mix going, uh, go ahead and keep firing away on questions like we've been doing the last couple days. So I noticed like with the croissants, we tray them up and then they go into the fridge, correct? Yes. So do you, y'all don't egg wash or anything before they go into the fridge? Well, so we keep our fridges humid most fridges are dry. Uh, in fact, our fridge, our walk-in in our new bakery will be dry. Uh, we, we won't have the ability to inject humidity on the cold side of the walk-in. We'll still have a humid proofer. Uh, most of the time, the only reason that uh, you, you really need to egg wash croissants going into the fridge is to prevent the skin from uh, prevent them from skinning up. Uh, it, the, the egg wash uh, provides protection uh, in the dry environment, it kind of seals it in. Um, some bakeries, do you guys do the double egg wash? Do you do like egg wash into the fridge and then egg wash coming out of the fridge or coming out of the proof? It's usually just once. Okay, some bakeries add a second layer of egg wash to, um, so that they get like a little bit more shine. We just go straight to that last uh, bit of egg washing um, because of the, the humidity in our fridges and we found that that, that works well. Um, we, we might egg wash into the fridge when we get to our new location if that's kind of the change that we have to make with our new environment. So. And you like after a bake, you don't butter wash or glissage or anything like that? you haven't seen a lot of it just because you've been here in the mornings and we're baking pastry at night for delivery in the morning. Um, so, so you just haven't seen that, that process. In fact, I hope that you're, that's why I want to get you guys in the oven room today a little bit because that, that whole side of things is still uh, a, an, an opportunity to see. Tomorrow you get to see the market. You've gotten to be in this like dough production room quite a bit this week. Uh, but hopefully with having the, some time in the oven room this morning, the big piece that you'll miss is the pastry bakes that I mentioned, it's like, it's really hard to capture everything there is to capture in a week. I, I think I've already worked over 40 hours this week. It's not Friday yet. Well, just beginning. Um, and I have not touched half this week, I feel like way behind. I haven't written a marketing email. I haven't, uh, which often is a daily thing for me. Uh, I haven't done a lot of my, my normal things because I'm in the bakery more, but it just kind of goes to show there's so much going on. And at any one moment, you're only observing. I feel like it's this room, then there's the oven room. 
then there's somebody doing something on logistics, and then there's somebody doing something in terms of sales really at, at every moment in time. And then that's happening two shifts a day. Um, so you guys are in one of, you know, four or five sort of macro stations that we're operating throughout the day at any given moment. So let's say one in five, you're seeing 20, you're still only seeing about 20% that there is to, that there is to see at any given moment, uh, even though that you've been here, uh, and you know, that, that was actually part of the overwhelm in all of this. Uh, and that's another thing to sort of discuss because I think one of the more fascinating topics is just like the compare, compare and contrast that we're in a house. Like that's, it's very odd, you know, that we are, but consider that if you go back in time, everything that you see, the further back in time, the less people involved. And so everything still has to get done. Um, and the time frames are still the same, like whether you're making 10 pastries or, or a thousand, uh, you still have to, you still have to get to the same places. You're just selling less at them. So there was a time where Amanda and I really had to see through a hundred percent of everything. Now I can work well over 40 hours and only see a fraction of things in a week and have to rely on, on the rest of the team. Uh, and yet financially, we just reached a position that it was, that it's viable to consider paying for a building and paying for the infrastructure related to a, a building. Um, so it, it just kind of goes to show the complexity of starting something like this in food. Notice that like, we do things in a particular way. Have the flows been different here at all? Uh, like, is it different to see something that every product is a 24 to 30 hour process versus what you might be used to in with yeast? Absolutely. Um, using commercial yeast at school, everything, like especially like when we went to, um, when we were doing bread class, most things were start to finish in one day, which would have been a six hour class for us or um, yeah, five hours. So it was start to finish. There were a few things that um, we refrigerated overnight and baked the next day, but it was never to this extent. Yeah, you guys haven't actually seen anything start to finish here, have you? The croissants. Well, it, well, well, not we start to finish. The bake. Yeah, you, but you still haven't seen it all. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of a brutal real reality that you can even be here a week and, and not see it all. Uh, I don't know if people realize that, like, did you know that we were all strictly sourdough? Like, I did not. We we're strictly sourdough, ladies and gentlemen. No, no yeast in the house. <laughs> Would that be if, so, so, okay, you guys have spent three days. Now, originally, when I inherited this thing, I had an extra couple weeks. So if you came next week and the following week, um, would you be ready to take it over? Without yeast? So is it scary to you? Like, well, is it still scary, the, the notion of not having yeast? Uh, after this week, or, or would it be, or, or is it more in the realm of possibility than it was? It's more in the realm of possibility watching you do it. I still feel like I would need to um, expand my knowledge on sourdough starters, but yeah. I think, yeah, it is more in the realm of possibility. Like, I wanna go back home now and, you know, like really dive deeper and learn more about this. So, so I haven't scared you away from sourdough then? No. No. Okay, that's good. No, nope. you've made us more interested in it. Definitely the sourdough croissants because I just love lamination most. Yeah. Um, so I really want to give those a try at home and just see how it works. So what, question, what other questions in any, 
uh, feel free to just keep firing away. So how would you revive a dead starter? So when we have our starter, it gets this like blackish liquid on top and we consider that kind of dead yeah. or very inactive. Uh, well, a truly dead starter, I might just start over at that level. Uh, but if it, I mean, if it's not alcohol -y on top, if it doesn't have a big hooch on top, um, then it's just feeding it. Uh, it's just, and, and sort of nurturing it back to life. Um, hitting the temperature, hitting the timing, uh, if it's if it's truly dead, then it's going to need more time, and it needs to be treated more like a brand new starter in that in that regard. But depending on how gross it is, I might just start over. Uh, I've never experienced it though, because uh, that's been too big of a fear to even allow for. So I'm sort of speculating myself. It's, uh, I mean, to me, it'd be no different than if, uh, if one of my dogs died. Like, I just like, it, it can't happen on my watch type, type deal. So, you know, whether, whether I was tired or not, like if Harriet needed, needed a feeding, like I got up and, and did the feeding, you know? So, uh, I, so I inherited Harriet when I took over Proof. That's been, uh, we're closing, closing in on four years. And then by the time I, by the time that uh, I had inherited Harriet, she was um, close to seven. So she's over 10 years old now. Um, and she was started by the uh, founder of Proof, uh, who then passed her on to me. So, but that, he left a pretty strong impression uh, because he, he was mindful, you know, the bakery was very chaotic at that time, super chaotic, uh, uh, just because it was one person trying to do all of this. And, uh, a lot of the parts don't change. Um, but the sourdough starter was pretty well kept, um, and it always has been. So, you know, we've, uh, it was just impressed upon me really early on. And over the course of the year, I sort of had to build a relationship with Harriet because, uh, well, you know, she kicked my butt a lot. <laughs> All right. Auto lease number two started 5 a.m. So 5.30 will scale this one out. Uh, this will be our olive, uh, formula and so I'm pretty sure our, our night crew already prepped the right amount of olives which is why there's a bin of olives that was waiting for me when I got in this morning uh, I'm gonna take the opportunity now to strain it uh, in the past I've always only shown putting inclusions in in terms of folding into the into the bins uh, today I'll put the olives in a little bit differently and mix them in at the very end of the mix. So they'll be the last thing that we put in the mixer. Um, mainly cause I want to just go through that way and, uh, and get a comparison. It's been a long time since I, I did it that way. Uh, and just recently I learned that sometimes I need to test that again because uh you guys you never got a chance to try the gochujang sourdough right that because i think we cut that last week the actual bread uh well so i was making it uh and i was making it very recently and we have this auto lease going right now so a little bit of dead time we can just talk Normally I'd be jumping on the sheeter right now, but uh, Adelia is back in today. Uh, so even though it's the last day of the week, 
Uh, today is going to be substantially lower key, um, just having an extra set of hands uh, versus the last few days. Um, so time at five in the morning to sit back and enjoy a coffee. And as you know, like once we've gotten going every day here, uh, doesn't really stop, does it? No. <laughs> so you mentioned um, to us a lot what made you buy the company and t turn it around and turn it into what you've made it now. Um, what drives you to keep doing that? What is your, what is your motivation or your ultimate goal? Uh, what drive, I'm going to separate that in a couple questions. Um, cause, uh, it's a big question. There's, there's a number of things driving me. Uh, hey, Delia. Uh, there's a number of things driving me. Uh, at the beginning, I was driven by a need for fulfillment. Uh, what, what I saw potentially in baking, I don't know, my gut was telling me that I that, that it would be fulfilling. Everything I knew about baking before I tried and then knowing what I knew about proof because I had been a customer for, for quite some time prior to that transition, knowing at least what I thought proof stood for, I was grounded in, in that identity. I was grounded in the identity of this old school uh, sourdough bakery that didn't cut corners on processes and showed its own community a way of having bread that that is is very uncommon um, in the world uh, you know across all the bread that's produced um, uh, and and a bread that you know could counter uh, all the things that are being said about bread these days as as not being a good part of our diets I've always found bread to be an important part of my life and and it's never you know, really good bread has never felt like something that's negative. And so I wanted to be a part of bread's like positive story um, at first. Uh, and then I fell in love, like really hard, hardcore into it. I really, really loved it. And the customers also became a really big driver uh, because we we're doing processes, everything end to end. I, uh, I was already working on Fridays when you came in, but you know, today when when you guys end, I'll have a little bit more work to do, and then I'll have a team that helps out so that I can be just one person and and work. You know, uh, twelve hours is 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 a lot to to work in a day. But you know, a typical Friday in the beginning was still the same three a.m. start, and truly, you know, the same type of a lack of breaks as you've seen in a single shift experienced all the way until Saturday afternoon when we finish tomorrow. So when you guys finish your market tomorrow and then consider still having to pick up the multiple markets from around the valley, bring back all the stuff, reset the bakery, and then be up again on, on Sunday morning, there was a lot that it was a continuous shift. It was, it was, I mean, working 24 hours straight every single week for any period of time is some form of like, you have to train at it uh, in order to tolerate it. And it's certainly not good for you, but I felt driven to do it because seeing customers reactions to bread every single week at the end of all my hard work, it was the most tangible thing that I've ever done in my life. You know, uh, you're here, you're doing something, you're pouring yourself into it and then and then immediately you take it somewhere and you share it with people and you know that it's being enjoyed simply by how they share it with you. And so I, I fed off of all of that for a really long time in the beginning. And then that also over time is not enough. And so I started seeking a little bit more balance, trying to balance out my schedule a little bit more and building the rest of the community, meaning making sure everybody involved is, is being taken care of. Uh, and it's, it's tricky uh, to, to, 
make sure that I, that there's enough to pay everybody. Um, but I think what what keeps me going right now is there's a lot of things to take care of, a lot of people. Uh, so still just as much passion for the bread and the community. That's a piece. But then, you know, you've met Kira now. Uh, and she she came in here the other day. Uh, you haven't met Amara, um, but you've met Amanda. Um, you've met a lot of the crew and really like all the people around here. It's plenty to to keep me motivated because I care about everybody. Um, so our own our own, you know, forward progress supported by the whole community in turn doing my part to support the community as well. Uh, it's just plenty. It's fulfilling. So before I put it in the bowl, give it a smell, take a look at it. Smell about what you remember from the last couple days. That's the goal. Uh, that this also, this is the core right here is can you start each day with something similar? Uh, because the, the biggest variance in the sourdough process will stem from this bucket. Uh, it's hard to tell, but there's you know, millions of microbes in this bucket, but it could be many millions, it could be a few millions, it could be a few thousands, and that all depends on how you treat this stuff in between and how you care for it in continuity. Uh, because this is a living set of organisms that requires a daily ritual. Uh, and in the beginning, we had no idea. Thankfully, sourdough starters are very forgiving. So you, you, asked, uh, you asked, like, how would you, how do you get engaged in something like this earlier? Uh, getting to know a sourdough starter and its various cycles is important. Another reason sourdough baking is a lifestyle is it's much healthier for the starter to be used frequently than to be put into dormancy for long periods of time. Uh, it's easier to bake with a starter that's already robust and being fed than to bake with a starter that isn't. And if you go and use a weak starter to try to produce something as difficult as a sourdough croissant, you'll find more limited success than with a robust starter. But at the beginning, we didn't know why our starter smelled slightly different each day. We were definitely mixing it uh, into our doughs at different stages of development each day. Uh, and consistency came over time. We, we never put our starter in a fridge when we first started. It was very old school, ambient, uh, refresh schedule, meaning three times a day, every eight hours we were feeding the starter. Uh, and we, I was terrified of the fridge because I didn't understand the effects. I knew that, I knew that the fridge slowed down fermentation, but I didn't have enough of a relationship with my starter to know when to refrigerate it so that it didn't um, under ferment or over or you know it, it didn't also go too deep into dormancy in the fridge now we can kind of we, we understand now uh, what the right cooling rate is um, so that we can use our starters through a shift even a whole day without having to constantly be looking for fresh because in the past I would have in the past, I would have had to really mix and be ready within, within an hour. Like I had an hour or two window within which to mix. Otherwise, I started to notice changes. Now I have more of a whole day because we can adequately manage it. So I'm glad you noticed that it's similar because we've been working hard for a long time to make sure that every day we start at a similar level. Had you guys fed a sourdough starter before yesterday? Uh, like we did yesterday? Had, had you ever fed 11 kilos of a sourdough? <laughs> 
So speaking of making your own, um, we made our starter and it was a five day process. Uh huh. What is your process like? Well, so it took me a while to even make a starter since I inherited one. Uh, but I've now made several starters. I've made a gluten free starter from quinoa flour. I've made a rye starter, uh, actually several rye starters from different rye flours. And I've now made a few wheat starters. Uh, and my process uh, is similar to all the other ones that I've ever seen out there where uh, you first just combine flour and water and typically you're waiting 24 hours on the first, uh, first go of it before you, uh, before you feed it again. Um, and then I'm just watching volumetric rise at the beginning. Uh, so once I see a doubling, I'll feed it. So I'll change the rhythm as I see that. Uh, and then once I start seeing more and more bubbles and it starts looking more and more like all the starters that we have here, then I start shifting the feeding routine closer to the one that we keep for Harriet, which uh, is still, uh, right now it's twice a day. Uh, so for me, it still is taking, I usually see quite a bit of activity in day two um, because I know how to keep the temperature really stable for day one. I'll use like my proofing room and, and isolate 84 degrees. We mentioned yesterday that 84 degrees is the, the ideal intersection of the wild yeast and lactobacillus that, that live in symbiosis with a sourdough starter. So if you keep that temperature, you're going to maximize fermentation for both. But similar process at the end of the day. So what is the reasoning behind um, why you do an auto lease for like your regular sourdough loaves and, or your olive and not for croissant dough? We've tried everything at least once, and thus far, any type of auto leasing that we've done in a stiff croissant dough has limited benefit, and it's primarily because of that original hydration level. So since croissant doughs are in the 50s, usually in terms of uh, water to flour ratio, uh, we don't see as much value. If you just mix water and flour together and it's half the half water to twice flour, meaning it's a 50% hydration, you, you don't actually get enough water in the dough to get rid of all the flour. Uh, so you still see flour chunks in that, in that hydration, like when you try to mix an auto lease, it's very difficult to actually get the same effect from the auto lease. It's too stiff for an auto lease. Um, you can do it, but like the benefit of the auto lease, the higher the hydration, the more beneficial it becomes because the dough strengthens together and is easier to handle, uh, is stronger overall with time. The stiffer doughs are plenty strong all on their own. Um, and, and again, it just becomes the difficulty of doing it. In a croissant dough, the way in which the dough becomes silky and smooth is the, the enrichment process of, of adding the sugars and the butters to it in the appropriate way. So at the end of the day, it's, it's just as beautiful of a dough, but developed very differently. The, the two for me are hard to compare um, because I almost, from my point of view, it's almost like I'm using water in the sourdough to do what, what all the enrichments in the croissant dough are doing to provide that silky smooth dough. But the result at the end is a silky smooth dough in both cases. So uh, I'm not going for a very different result in feel and texture but I'm going about getting there very differently. So in one case, it's butter, sugar. In another case, it's uh, just water. Uh, and the auto lease seems to be a tool related to water more so than anything else. It benefits the flour, but the more, the more water in your dough, the more effective the auto lease strategy becomes from, from my point of view.
So I'm going to flip around the mix now. Olives carry a ton of moisture inside. It's they, they just hold on to their water really a lot. And, it, and so you're, if, you, if you have olives in your dough, it's very easy to have very different doughs just simply by getting this part wrong. We talked about the bassinage having, having like a, a few percentage points. In my case, it's about 4% of the water of the formula I have left over at the end. Um, to play with uh, and in this case depending on since I'm deciding to put the olives in during the mix I can still use the water at the end as a buffer so if the olives are super wet I can say okay I'm gonna cut a little water to get the right texture uh, I can tell when I put an inclusion in a dough when it's too much when when it starts to really get at the dough um, when it when it affects the overall texture of the dough where it's not strong enough. Uh, and it's usually a, a case of hydration. Uh, the inclusion's too wet. Uh, and, or, but the inclusion can easily be too dry too. Uh, it, you want to put things in your dough that have a similar level of water content as the dough itself. Then you know it has a minimal effect on on your whole process going forward. If you put things in your dough that are way drier than your dough, then it's going to fundamentally change the resulting bread. Multigrains get very sandy very quick because of that. People don't soak their grains and they dry out their doughs. Uh, wet ingredients uh, have the opposite problem of making the dough way too high hydration um, and making it sloppy and, and hard to deal with. So. Olives are a tricky one in that, in that regard, so I'm really trying to get as much out of them as I can. Um, and the more I do, the, the better off I found that I am. Also, the other benefit, so my olive mill sends me pitted olives. I'm supposed to have olives without pits here except if you actually sift through them you'll always find some and if you've ever if you've ever bit into an olive pit it's a uh, kind of a rough experience that i certainly don't want for my customers it's a guaranteed complaint if there's an olive pit in the dough so in addition to straining out any liquids you can find these things and I always worry because these are supposed to already come pitted to me but apparently the pitting process is not a perfect process so the question is should we go industrial industrial with our olive buying just because I find some pits and olives or or should we get more educated about our ingredients and learn what it takes to handle them a little bit better in, in food. You see, I'm like still probably going to end up with half a liter of water out of this uh, set of olives that was already strained once. Like it, it was already agitated and strained overnight. So it's one thing I would impress upon this part is you only even saw part of the straining activity. Um, but that's just what we found is necessary with olives. Otherwise, there's just too much of a variance. I would rather, uh, I'd rather not be surprised by the amount of water that's then absorbed by the dough. So normally I've been doing inclusion mixing, folding it in, but this is an example of how you can mix inclusions in a mixer as gentle as this one is basically going to do something very similar to what I've been doing in the bins and in some cases a better play. Uh, if you've seen the video on making gochujang sourdough, uh, I'm going to have to make an update video at some point because we learned that putting the gochujang 
mix in this way was far more effective in that particular uh, variation. So I guess what we're learning in that is the wetter the inclusion, the more likely I might go this way. Um, but there's other moments where the inclusion's very abrasive. We're folding it in and using that technique that we've covered in that mixing inclusions video um, is the way to go, uh, where you're at each bin and folding the inclusions in. And it's really just a matter of what, what are you dealing with? Nuts in particular are very sharp in the dough, and so being able to gently fold those in is better than running them through a mixer where they're just tearing through your dough almost like bullets. Um, but you know, olives are soft and wet. Gochujang is soft and very wet. Uh, so you know, you can use you can use the mixer to your advantage. You can use bins to your advantage. Both techniques have a place. It just uh, depends on what, what you're doing. It's also quite rare for us to be making this large of a batch with a single thing in it. Uh, our base sourdough breads, yes, we, we make these big batches all the time, but uh, you know, it takes a particular day of the week, like a Saturday market, for us to have enough demand to make 120 uh, olive loaves. So making, doing inclusions through the folding method makes a lot more sense when you don't have huge volume. But of course, if you can make 120 of something all at once versus splitting it seven ways, well, I mean, I'm probably saving myself 45 minutes uh, of work by doing it this way. I've taken this mix far enough. So, oh, did you ask about folding? Yes. Uh, I would say we can start them all together. Um, we'll scale out the olive right now, and then we'll immediately transition to the first set of folds for the sourdough. Uh, and you guys can just roll right into the olive. Um, the olive dough is pretty, is gonna be a lot tenser in general, but it'll be fine to fold it on the same ritual. So we'll probably look at 6.30, 7 o'clock, 7.30 folding schedule as an estimate. And we'll be right on time to scale bread right at 8, 8 in the morning. Uh, so we'll scale these out together. And then I'm going to have you guys split up at that point. For um, sourdough, like focaccia, what would the process be like? There's two potential processes. One is one where you can turn, you can turn an overproofed loaf into a saving of the day focaccia if you need to. So like suppose you turn your loaves over and maybe your fridge got too warm or or you know you just didn't get to it in time, whatever, um, and it looks very pancakey on the board. You might just choose to lean into that a little bit and flatten it out the rest of the way. Put the dimples in, brush some oil on it, you know, put whatever else you want on it if you'd like, and throw it in the oven. And your overproofed loaf became something quite. All of a sudden you have a new special um, for the week and people are excited and it turned out of your you know misery so i love focaccia in that regard that it's like uh we did that once last year going into summer i i think one of our walk-ins failed um yeah, on a critical moment and so friday morning i'm pretty sure i sent an email saying uh emergency focaccia and it all sold within 10 minutes like online like it, it never even saw the light of day it was one of the most popular items that we made in the last 12 months probably and it came out of an emergency um, so that is definitely my favorite application of focaccia in a different form you can be a little bit more intentional about the dough it can be it can be a softer dough uh, because because of the different strength building um, you're trying to look for that like more wild openness on the inside. Um, 
And so you're still, you're doing a lot of the same processes of time, but on the table, you might flatten out the sheet on the table, um, get it onto sheet pans, dimple it, and then, uh, and then top it with oil or, or whatever it is that you want to do to finish your focaccia. So um, we can't wait to get into more of that. Um, we think that a bread like that is really best had shortly after it comes out of the oven. So we expect that we'll be able to explore that in our new space when we can bake and have customers there at the same time where, you know, customers aren't allowed back here. So. Abby, you want to try your hand at this? All right, I'll switch you. So my suggestion, dip your left hand in the water. Try to roll up your sleeve as much as you can. Now, reach on the side until your whole wrist is under and don't grab the dough with your hand, but rather try to grab the dough with your arm. It's a little bit hard. Yeah, if you can get an even better grip, see like, <laughs> yeah, so. That is much diff more difficult than it looks. Yeah, so you got your first 200 grams out of 12,800. Yeah, Way to go. <laughs> Okay, and now grab your knife and cut right below. Just don't cut yourself. All right, pretty good. That was way better. 4,000 on that one. You just have to, I feel like you just have to go under it more. Yeah. You know? I like to grab it from the sides, like you're going right in. I like to slide, slide my hand like where, like actually on the side of the bowl where okay. I can just go. I can usually get it deeper that way, I find. We're getting there. Oh yeah. Yeah, that's a lot. Nice, nine. You're going to 12, eight. Pretty good. The goal is sheets and sh sheets of smooth dough giving minimal tearing to the dough which you're doing a pretty good job even like even though some of these these pieces like actually are coming out pretty clean for you so that's that's all set to go go ahead and move that one over keep it coming we might need a few more bins audrey I spec this out. I think I originally gave you as though we were making 120 and I'm sure we're gonna make more like 130. How do you get it to cut so even? I actually, here, check it out. So you're like, you're slicing at it like a serrated, uh, whereas I'm chopping at it more like an ax. Oh, okay. Gotcha, let's try that. There you go. There we go. Just don't chop your hand, please. <laughs> <laughs> Be like awful, awful if it's like <laughs> chop at it on video and then. <laughs> well, that one didn't work out as good. Okay. 92, it takes a 19. second to get this right. Yeah. I'm seeing this. This is definitely not one of those things that I usually introduce on day one to people because it's actually, like you said, it's surprisingly harder than it looks. Yeah. Yeah. Audrey got that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, that we're just, back to the first yeah. one. <laughs> I just, you didn't quite have a grip on it, that's all. Nice. 
It's going to be over probably, right? Yeah, 12,000. Where are we? 12,891. Oh, so I have a... There we go.